Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We're so thankful that you have joined us. We're glad that you're here. We're gonna talk about plants and bugs and insects and diseases and all things gardening. So thanks for joining us. My name is Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois on the Urbana Champaign campus and I'm in the crop sciences department. So if there's any cut flower questions or perennial landscaping questions, I will answer those. But there are three highly talented people right here with me. Let's find out their area of expertise and you can direct your calls and your interests towards their area. And I'm gonna start first with Mike Brunk. Hi, Mike. Evening, how are you? Doing good. I'm the Urbana City Arborist with the City of Urbana and my specialty is trees. I know a little bit about turf and some things about landscape recycling. Excellent, well, now we're gonna ask you to answer a question. Okay. What have you got for us? All right, I've got actually two questions that um, are similar. So I'm gonna read them both and give them both the same answer. Uh, we have a snowdrift crab apple tree that is approximately 20 years old. In the last few weeks, there have been sporadic blooms, some single, some multiple. Uh, this is the first year it has happened. Have you ever heard of this before? And question two is, I have a white lilac bush which started developing buds and today is blooming. I'm concerned with the cold weather coming, uh, all the buds will be killed and it won't bloom next spring. Can you tell me why this is happening? Uh, these are all good questions and this happens on occasion. And uh, what's going on is the trees are tricked basically into blooming in the fall thinking that they are going into spring. And why that is this year I think is because we've had ample moisture throughout spring and early summer and so the trees didn't develop a very extensive root system and then we go into a short little droughty period and it goes trees go into what they call an ectodormancy so um, they uh, stop growing uh, the, at least the parts above ground and the energy goes into the roots uh, reaching for the moisture but those parts above ground kind of go into a, a latent stage of a dormancy type deal and um, then we get rain again and it's it's hey it's springtime <laughs> so um, some of the flower buds are, are, are showing up here in fall because of that oddity now you know this is the Midwest um, mother nature's never the same from year to year so trees are resilient I don't think it's gonna hurt them you may lose some flowers next spring but I think they'll be fine but that's what's going on so it was crab apples and a potential lilac Right. Maybe. Yeah. Interesting. And I was saying a few weeks ago, my bottle brush buckeye produced another flower, which is, I think, very unusual. So let us know what you have that's reflowering, but it's all the same answer. It is. It's getting tricked. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Mike, very much. And now let's go to the man in the middle, Dr. Don White. <laughs> I am Don White. I'm an emeritus professor of plant pathology from the University of Illinois. While on the faculty, I taught introductory plant pathology to a lot of very bright students. Oh, yes. <laughs> and diseases of field crops and diseases of ornamentals and turf grasses and did research on corn diseases, genetic resistance. More recently, I have become a master gardener, which has been just an all kinds of fun. It's a good volunteer activity. If you want to go through the training, uh, you can check it out on the internet. You can probably get registered now for training this spring. Okay, now, do you have something to show us? Something brand new? I've or got old? something that I hope you haven't seen before. It's called bacterial fasciation. And I really would like to call it bacterial fascination because this is a bacterial disease that occurs primarily on vegetatively propagated plants from greenhouses. I've seen it on geranium, uh, rigor begonias, African violets, and a few things like that. It forms what's called leafy galls on the bottom of the plant. Mm -hmm. And generally what happens, you see this most often on plants that are coming out of the greenhouse, that are vegetatively propagated. And what's happening is we're using more and more uh, hormones and things like that in greenhouses. We're doing more cell culture. And we're also reusing soil a lot of times in some of these bigger commercial uh, greenhouses. And this bacterium just lives on the surface it's only been found outdoors one time that I know of, and that's on pistachio roots in California. So I don't think we have pistachio trees here, so I doubt if this would overwinter here. 
I'd love to be able to see if it would be, but that's beside the point. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I think it's kind of a neat little disease. It is really interesting, but it's, n it's probably not good. Well. It's good if you're a plant pathologist. Yeah, it's good if I'm a plant see. pathologist, sure. I think and it's kind of neat. Don, what would most greenhouse people do with those plants if they found it? They'd throw them out. Well, actually, what they'd probably do is throw them into the discord, uh, discard pile and then maybe try to uh, compost that soil mix and maybe to come back and get them again. Oh, I great. Hope. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, that's interesting. I'd not seen that before, so thanks for bringing that. Okay, now we're going to go next to the person next to me. And this is Dr. Jim Appleby. What have you got for us, Jim? Well, you know, I'm an entomologist at the University of Illinois, so I deal with the insects and mites attacking trees, shrubs, and flowers. Now, you know, we're all interested in natural insect control. Mm -hmm. And one of the best natural agents to control insects are birds. And we all like to feed birds, and we like to view birds, et cetera, et cetera. And we like to feed them birds, it, particularly in the wintertime, it's really important. Uh, birds have a very high metallic rate, and so they really need uh, food all the time during the winter months. If they don't get that, they don't survive. One thing, if you feed the birds, though, you have problems with raccoons and squirrels and possums. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they get in the feeders and actually destroy the feeders. One method that I have found that really works well is to use a PVC pipe now, I can't bring in the whole pipe, so this is just a, a sample of a, a, a pipe. And we're going to have how to make this bird feeder next week on the website. Okay, so great. So I can't give you all the details right now. It's too lengthy. But on the next week's website, you'll have, be able to read this about the birds. Essentially, what it is, though, is a PVC pipe. And so the animals can't get their claws into this pipe, and uh, they can't get up. Uh, when you do have this pipe, it's very important to have a, a lid on the pipe because several years ago I had one of these and I did not have a lid, lid on it and gosh, a little screech owl fell down in the pipe and of course it died. So very important to seal the pipe. Then on this pipe you can attach bracts like this and then you can use your, uh, hang your feeders on these bracts. If we could show that picture of the one I have at home, um, that shows uh, what the actual pole looks like. And so that's what the pole looks like. And you can see I have quite a few different feeders on the, uh, on the pole. And it really has worked very, very well. I don't have any problems now with squirrels getting up into my feeders or raccoons or anything mm -hmm. else. Because so they just can't grasp onto that. They the, can't grasp on, onto that. And so, yeah, and so they just fall down and uh, it really works out well. And it's really fun to feed birds and it to is. see what. And we have so many different species of birds in, in the area. So it's really a lot of fun. Good. So natural insect control. Natural insect control. Thank you, Jim, very much. I appreciate that. Well, let's go to our section on the Did You Know part of the show. Come here. 34 to 36 million Christmas trees are produced each year, and 95% are shipped or sold directly from Christmas tree farms. We are getting people ready, thinking about Christmas trees. Okay, well, let's go to the phone lines now, and Ron has a question about ginkgos for us on line two. Hi there, Ron. Yeah, hi there, yeah. Um, I have a question about, a, I have a mature ginkgo tree in my front yard, a female ginkgo tree. Um, I've lived in this house for about four years, and every year, it seems like about by about this time, it's developing all kinds of um, berries and starting to drop them and making a mess. But I've noticed this year, for whatever reason, um, I haven't seen a single uh, fruit on the tree, and um, I swear that normally by this time, they're all over the place. So I'm wondering if it's uh, normal for them to have um, kind of non-producing years like that. Maybe. Most people would be relieved. Yeah, that, I think that's rare, and it sounds yeah. like you might have had uh, a frost nip the buds just at, at the exact right time <laughs> in the springtime to keep it from uh, fruiting this year. I'm really surprised. I was talking with some of my students and um, how they would select them in, for eating. You know, so in their their culture, they would eat them, and I thought, oh, I should have asked how. 
Is it prepared in a certain way? And uh -huh. is it before it smells? I don't know how it works, but I am very surprised. So Ron, you are fortunate, it yeah, sounds that, like. That's an odd year. You'll probably continue to get fruit year after year. Okay, well good, thank you for that comment and question. Let's go to Ruth's question about thornless blackberries on line three. Hi Ruth. Hello, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. I have um, two thornless uh, blackberry bushes. I planted one in the spring this year and one uh, in the fall last year. And they both had uh, berries this year. But my question is, is they have grown so much. Now, should I uh, tr cut these off, trim them, or should I just leave them? Because they have really grown. Okay, we need Bob Skirvin here. But as I recall, they fruit on the, on the second year growth. And so you can wait a little bit. I usually do it more in spring or you can trim them now, but I wait to see the darker, the ones that have turned a darker color, and the, the new ones, you can tell, they're a little shinier, and you trim out the old ones, and I usually do it in the spring, although you can do it now. Now, I know that um, Bob also talks about trimming them back to you know, not be 10 feet long, but you can trim back the tips, but otherwise, take off the old growth and let the new growth come along. So, I don't know if anyone wants to chime in, but that's how I recall, and that's what I do with mine. I trim them in spring, the old canes. And you can tell them, they will almost break off too. So you can decide how uh, energetic you are, whether you wanna do it now or in the spring. Okay, thank you Ruth for your question on thornless blackberries. Let's go to Pat's question, and it's about roses on line five. Hello, Pat. Hello, and thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. I have a climbing rose bush, and I didn't cut all the roses off because they were too far up for me. And they had developed like a red seed ball on them. Oh. Is that really a seed? That is rose hips. It's after the plant, you let the flower go, it develops rose hips. I have a lot of rose hips, it's a source of vitamin C and people use them in teas. I use them for decoration uh, as well. You can use them for vitamin C. So some years they don't produce them as much. I think this year is a good year, unlike the ginkgos <laughs> is producing. So you have rose hips. That is what you hear when people say that, it's after the rose has flowered. Okay, well thank you, Pat. That's a, a really beautiful thing. Looks great with leaves and other you know, gourds and things as well. All right, let's go to a question by, uh, from Pat, or no, from Kay on line six about a pine tree. Hi Kay, what is your question? Hello, I had an arborist come and look at my neighbor's pine tree about two and a half years ago. It has uh, dead needles on it. There's a row of pine trees. This one seems to be the only one that has a problem. They told me that's just the nature of a pine tree. In listening to your program, I thought one of the guests on there stated that some of the, uh, it looks like a white pine. Some of those did have a disease and I would like to plant something in an area, uh, right kind of across the fence. Didn't know if I should what's going on? Should the tree be cut back, cut down? Can I plant something? Okay, Mike, I'm looking at you. Okay, well the best thing you can do when you've got a hedgerow of pines and you want to plant more pines uh, is to mix it up. So maybe some spruces, uh, concolor or uh, Norwegian spruce or something different because if it's a disease uh, with that particular tree and you plant the same kind of tree, more than likely it's going to spread to that tree. But it's unlikely if you plant something different. So really to know the, the exact answer though, we have to key out what exactly is wrong with that particular tree. What kind of a tree is it? Is it a white pine? Is it a Colorado spruce? Uh, and then that would guide you possibly on uh, what you should plant, what you shouldn't plant, depending on what kind of tree it is and what kind of probably fungal disease it has. And um, I'll jump in because the last several weeks we have been talking about diseases on 
blue spruce specifically. So it hasn't been pine disease, it's been everything that blue spruce gets. You know what the white pines are doing now though? Well, they're, yeah, the white pines are just dropping their, yeah. their two-year-old needles. So that's what she needs to know as well. So and that's on the inside of the white pines. Mm -hmm. You'll see the needle drop right now, and that's just um, uh, a, a typical shedding. There's nothing wrong with the, if it's a white pine, with the white pine. It kind of yellows, and they drop the needles on the inside of the tree. And Sounds you can like tell that the older, the older is what's dropping, not the newer. Right. It's on the inside, not the outside. And it sounds like the arbor said it was just a natural thing, but make sure that it is a second year. So, but anyway, good So, so good the tips answer. are still green? These are not dropping from the inside. They are clear out to the tip, and okay. it's not my pine tree. It's my neighbor's pine tree. Okay, do you know how many uh, needles you have for fascicle? In other words, oh, you... my goodness. Are sake. they soft? Are they soft needles or are they long pointed no, ones? No, they are very coarse. Pointed? Oh. Sharp? Okay, you might have pine wilt there. It's a nematode yes. disease that uh, has killed out lots of Austrian and red and Scotch pine and it's very deadly. Mm -hmm. It's reported in the literature on white pine, but it, I've never seen one. Mm -mm. So if, and white pine a lot of times does fairly well in terms of disease resistance. And uh, so if you wanted to plant a pine, I think I'd select white pine. And then go with fir and you know, other things, but not They don't like Colorado ice storms. Spruce. No, they don't like ice storms. <laughs> Very few but pines no, do. If you have the space, Norway spruce is beautiful. Oh, they I are. love con color fir when you mentioned that. Or a uh, 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 limber pine. Yes. Very tough. Mm -hmm. It looks like a white pine. So just avoid anything long and pointed. Austrian, Scotch. I'm surprised they live this long. Yeah. I mean, and I'd avoid Colorado blue spruce because absolutely. of right Philly and needle, needle cast. So. Okay, so do a little homework, but these are good suggestions. So thank you for that question. That was very good. We'll do one more question, and let's go to Mark's question on line two about oak gall. Hi, Mark. Hi, how are you doing tonight? Doing great. And your question? Uh, we have several oak trees, and we have the uh, oak gall in it from the oak gall wasp, and I'd like to know if there's any procedure to get rid of that and protect the tree. Okay, Jim, do you want to take it away? Well, w would you describe the appearance of the galls? Well, they're large, round, hard balls. And that... they're on the branches? Right. Yeah, that's the horned oak gall. And I'll tell you, there's really no good treatment for that. Uh, we do find that some trees are resistant to galling. Uh, sometimes you'll find a tree that's heavily infested, and then right next to it is one that's completely free of galls. But uh, there's really no good treatment for that, unfortunately. And uh, if you go in the state, uh, particularly in, in our state, uh, about the middle of the state around Mount Vernon, it's extremely serious in that area. It actually is killing some of the trees. But uh, unfortunately, there's just no control of it known yet. Okay, well, we're sorry to pass that along to yeah, you, but that news. is the answer. All right, now I'm going to start over with you, Mike, if you want to answer. We're going to do another round of questions or show and tell. Okay, well, um, we had a caller send in a picture um, of a tree from a distance, if we could show that. Uh, it's a nice fall color tree, uh, and we are to provide some input on what we think it is. And so, um, here it is, okay. So I think from a distance, this looks like a white ash. Mm -hmm. uh, she uh, or he describes the tree as the outer leaves are deep purple. Well, there's a species of ash, a variety called autumn purple. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a variety called autumn applause. Um, uh, either way, uh, it's more than likely this is a white ash. Now, I'd have to say that it's a very healthy looking tree to keep it that way because of the emerald ash borer, the tree really needs to be treated. Uh, so the owner of the tree should look into uh, their local arborists and having the tree treated with, uh, uh, there's several different kinds of treatments, but uh, more than likely they're gonna wanna prevent this tree from getting emerald ash borer to keep it alive. Okay, 
And just a little heads up, if you have a distant picture of a tree, if you could send a picture of the leaf, that would really... That was a guess. It's, that, I think, that's, it, it's an I think tree, you're right, but boy, it'd been really quicker. If, if we have a <laughs> close-up of the leaf uh, detail or, or fruit, if they have that yes. available. But still, I think that was a really pretty autumn applause or autumn... What was the other one? Autumn, autumn purple. Autumn purple. All right, thank you, Mike, for that. And now let's go to you, Don. Yes, I have a disease of zinnia that's very common. It's called bacterial blight. Uh, there's an alternaria leaf blight on zinnia that also is fairly common. And really it's difficult to tell the difference between bacterial blight on zinnia and alternaria leaf blight. And here we have the bacterial disease. It's planted, it's in zinnia stand that had a lot of grass weeds in it, okay. Now if you go to the next slide, and then the next one, now here at close up, a lot of times on bacterial blight, the lesion is going to be limited by the veins. It's going to be kind of squared off and keep going. Next slide, keep going. Here's what I wanted. Take a little section of leaf, put it in a microscope, slide the drop of water, and what is this, Diane? You had the course. Ooze. Yes, this is bacterial <laughs> ooze. Basically what this is, this is a cloud of bacteria that comes from the leaf tissue. Now, a lot of times you'd like to know if it's bacterial blight or alternaria blight because the bacterial blight is seed borne and a lot of times when you buy a seed package, you're buying the bacteria along with it. And in wet years like this past year, bacterial blight on zinnia has been mm -hmm. very serious. And really, if you don't mind the leaf blight, I guess that's okay. But there's a lot of resistance, differences in susceptibility. So with most of the herbaceous ornamentals, I would recommend going to Arboretum Gardens or Idea Gardens or something like that where they have plants that are labeled. Find things that you think are pretty in terms of flowers and things that have healthy leaves. Then buy those varieties. Mm -hmm. Just and you don't can take compare it side yeah, by and side. And you don't have to take the pictures in the book. Go find some real stuff and look at the leaves and the flowers. And there are places all over yes. Middle America that you can go to that are labeled well. Yes. That's a good hint, but bacterial ooze, I'd forgotten all about that, and then there it was. Oh, boy. That's the reason I brought it. <laughs> <laughs> but zinnias had it, but mine did grow out of it once it got yeah. less wet. So They're favored by wet weather. Very much so. Okay, thank you, Don. And now, Jim. Well, I talked about uh, different bird feeders. Uh, some of these that can be hung by that PVC pipe, or this one is a, a, a cage that actually can put suet in, beef suet and woodpeckers and uh, nuthatches and uh, chickadees just love the suet. So that's a neat thing, you just hang it from that pole like this. Then the other feeder I have, this is a Baltimore Oriole feeder. Now I live out in the country and have very tall trees. So if you have that kind of a site, uh, I, I think I would suggest you put up a Baltimore Oriole feeder. I put some uh, some uh, grape jelly in this uh, in a bowl that puts in here and this is a nice feeder because it it's protected from the rain. Now Diane I told you this before several years ago when I conducted a test I put out two packages I mean two jars of um, grape jelly I mean four jars of grape jelly two of them were the cheap store brand <laughs> and two of them were made of from by Welch's or, or Smucker's the Baltimore Oils definitely down the expensive grape jelly, but they didn't touch the store watch. Whoa, you Eventually have. they would, but you know, so they really, we ought to feed them. You have the uptown, uptown. Orioles. You know, and this, this is a nice feeder too, because I put this uh, little moat up, moat up here to keep the ants away. So you fill this mm -hmm. with water and then the ants can't get down to the And grape they jelly. will. And They'll they go will. go the cheap jelly. Yeah, right. Right. They <laughs> probably would go for the cheap jelly. You know, my Orioles like, um, uh, orange is better Oranges. than grape. Oh. We've tried wow. that as well. Then the other feeder, I really like this feeder that put the uh, sunflower seeds in it. It's got this nice top on it so it's protected from the rain and it works out really well. You just hang that nice. by that PVC pipe. So this is sort of the Cadillac in uh, bird feeders. And drainage holes. Drainage wow. holes. Really, really nice. 
it is so fun to it is to, fun. to watch yeah. them and see what birds you have. Yeah. And if you have this, they will come, and you don't even know they're in the area. I generally, s tell people that they want Orioles, they need to get the Peter up with grape jelly by the by the middle of April. They generally come the last week in April. But they're beautiful birds. I have generally three pairs of old Orioles every oh, year. That's great. I think we had two pair, two pair this yeah, year, yeah, and it's yeah. it's just yeah. really fun to watch yeah, it. It really is. I'm telling you, the uh, questions and the show and tell are just right. That's what we like to see. So thank you, folks, for bringing all of your expertise to the show. And we want to thank each of you for watching. It's so great to hear from you. I hope you have a great week gardening. See you next time. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.